Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder as I step off the train and deliver an episode to you while I walk home. I'm Brendan Riley. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, listeners. It is a disturbingly warm afternoon here in suburban Chicago. Uh, it is February 26th, and my phone says it's 70 degrees out. Uh, that is terrifying. It means I don't have to wear my jacket on the walk home, but yikes. Well, on to more happy news. Uh, I've gotten some good feedback from my stats episode. Uh, both Chris Hickman and Gabriel Edge reached out with comment. So thanks for those comments, folks. Chris, <laughs> his first message was like, you can't sort by how often you win a game? What? <laughs> Yeah, it turns out I just was not looking at the right screen. If you go in, okay, so today I'm going to talk about Board Game Stats, the Board Game Stats app some more, just because uh, it felt like there was more to say after the last conversation. Um, and uh, both Gabriel and uh, Chris offered useful and helpful thoughts. So this, this additional commentary reflects their thoughts and comments as well. And then if I have time left over, I'll talk about other game stuff. But I think this will mostly mostly be board game stats part two. So it occurred to me that I've, I haven't really played around in the app as much as I probably could or should have. So I spent a little bit of time today looking through the help menus and reading about the different features and uh, reflecting on stuff that Chris pointed out to me last time. And uh, I thought I would discuss a little bit more uh, what, I, what I found. So one thing was uh, Chris suggested instead of looking at the game pages and seeing how well I did at each game, I could just look at the player page and see how well I do at each game. And turns out, yeah, that's a good way to do it. So there are a variety of different paths that I can use to reflect on my skill in games. From the player page, it shows my win percentage, for example, and I can uh, organize the game by win percentage to see how well I do overall. And one of the things is I find that organizing by win percentage alone is not a very useful metric because every game that I've played one or two times and won when I played it gives me a really high win percentage. So there's just this huge list of games that have a very high win percentage because I won the first time I played and I haven't played it again since, which makes for an interesting glance on my board game stats, but not a very interesting glance in terms of conversation with you listeners. Uh, that said, there are other things that do present themselves in interesting ways. You can organize by game name or how many plays you've done or all sorts of different things and you'll get a variety of different stats about yourself as a gamer. I also have a number of different things that are interesting. So I have, for example, 6,076 plays logged in Board Game Geek or in Board Game Stats, 311 of which are ignored. I recently learned about this, I realized that my win stats and other things were getting screwed up by cooperative games because like, I don't consider it a personal win when there's a cooperative game or when I'm looking at somebody's win percentage, how often they win at cooperative games doesn't feel uh, useful to me. So I've been slowly going through and using within the board game stats, there is a place where you can mark this thing that says ignore for statistics. And when you mark ignore for statistics, it still remembers the game played it still lists like how many times you played it and all of that. But when it calculates your win percentage or any of that, it leaves out any games you've ignored for statistics. So I am making a habit of anytime I play a cooperative game, ignoring for statistics. And I'm also sometimes going back and doing that with old plays of similar games. Uh, but I get a lot of different stats out of board game stats. One of my favorites, I have logged plays with 1,051 other people. Uh, or 1,052, excuse me. So that's pretty fun in the last six years. Now this includes online play. And so in the last six years, I have played with something like a thousand, just over a thousand other people. And that's pretty cool. I've also look, logged 68 different locations, which uh, I think is fun also. Um, so yeah, lots of really interesting things. I've played 1,149 different games. And my H index is 29, meaning that my, I have 29 different games that I have played 29 times. And apparently there are not 30 games that I've played 30 times. There could be more than 29 that I've played 29 times. 
but definitely not 30 for 30. So I guess I should go through that list of 29 and play them each once. See if I can bump that up to 30. So that's uh, my personal player page, but the uh, real uh, excitement was in the insights page that Chris highlighted for me. Now this is, I use this regularly, insights, to look at a variety of things. Uh, usually when I'm doing my top of the stack episode, I will use insights to discuss how the different um, games that I've played are reflected. But what I hadn't looked at was a variety of different metrics that are displayed on this. The person I play games with most is my wife. She's got, I've logged 1,722 games with her, which is roughly somewhere just over 25% of the games I play, I play with her, which is a delight, I will say. I have a spreadsheet here that shows my, uh, in the insights by, by player, there is a list of a number of things. There's a list of how, <clears throat> how many games you've played. There's a list of uh, the number of different games played. There is a list of number of different locations that player has played at. <clears throat> the number of different players you've played with. The total time played. So if you use the timer feature, it will track that. The number of wins in non-ignored plays, meaning how, often, how many times total have you won. Then it's got your win percentage. And then it's got your win chance. And it's win chance that is particularly interesting to me. Uh, and win percentage. So win chance is calculated as the likelihood that you'll win a game if you play it and your win percentage indicates or the, excuse me the win chance is the calculation of your the possibility that you could win you could win the game just based on player count it is literally the number that i was wondering about when we were talking about setting up games the personal win percentage is shaped around the idea of calculating all of these numbers to give you a sense of are you more likely or less likely to win a game than you should be. And the nice thing about the insights page is that it displays that number in color. It gives you a cheerful green. Actually, it's a dark kind of foresty green. If you're win, if you are above what your win percentage would be, or what I was calling your fair win, your fair win chance. And it's red if your number is below your win chance. So in any given game you play, the chance that you win the game is indicated in green. Your personal win chance is indicated in green if you're likely to win, and red if you're not likely to win. So in that regard, my personal win chance is 37%. That means in any given, uh, well, my, per my personal win percentage is 37%. My personal win chance is 38%. So I am slightly less likely to win a game that I play than would be my fair share of games that I play. I think that's really interesting to see sort of how the app imagines you, what the app says your chances are, and how it imagines it are. Now, what I have not figured out how to do I, is to look at that number by game. I wonder if it's possible to look at that number from game to game. They have your win percentage on games you look at, but they don't say your win chance, which again is determined by a lot of things, but should be determined by the number of players in the game. Uh, and I don't see um, that particular stat uh, in this display. But all in all, some really interesting stuff going on in board game stats. And if you haven't looked around in there, I recommend it because there's a lot more than I realized is going on in those charts. So what insights have you found in board game stats? I'd love to hear. Head over to Board Game Geek Guild 3269 and share those with me. Well, I've got a little bit of time before I get home, so wanted to share a little bit more about games we've been playing lately. I'm not gonna talk about any new games right now, but uh, I think there's some interesting stuff to share. Uh, particularly, I'm very excited the new campaign for Arkham Horror is out. It's called the Campaign, or the Festival of Hemlock Vale. Uh, it's got a sort of cheery orange cover and beautiful imagery that reminds me a little bit of uh, something like Midsummer. It feels like folk horror, and in fact, that is the idea. Like, there's an island, and there's people on the island that are having some sort of terrifying ceremony. And as an investigator, you're going there to find out what's going on with the ceremony, and you're probably in trouble. So, that's exciting. 
I got both the campaign expansion and the investigator expansion for that. It was sort of fun. I went to I went to the game store and I was just looking around and I saw this expansion on the shelf. I was like, oh wow, how exciting. I really want to get this. So I brought it up to the counter and I said, oh, I'm very excited for this. I didn't even realize it was out. I had heard they were working on another one, but I didn't remember whether I had ordered it or not. Can you check? And so they checked. And in fact, I had ordered it and they did have a copy waiting for me behind the shelf or in the back room, uh, which I don't know, maybe they emailed me about it and I missed it or it was busy and they didn't email me or it got caught in spam or something. So I didn't, I didn't have it, but that means I got 10% off because I had pre-ordered it, which unfortunately in Chicagoland just means I don't have to pay the tax, but still 10% is 10%. Um, so very excited for that. I'm not sure when we'll play it next because usually when we play that with my son, it's as a campaign game. And right now we just started a different win, which I haven't talked about on the podcast yet. So I'm keeping it secret, but that will probably be something we'll do soon down the line. Certainly, although I was looking forward actually to going back to some of the older campaigns that we, that my wife and I played years ago. And now that my son is playing with us, we could return to, but uh, we could play the new one. That's fine. There's one other bit of gaming news that I thought was interesting and maybe worth talking about for the last five minutes here. It is not board gaming, but rather video gaming. You know, I don't do much video gaming, although I have recently bought a new computer, as I mentioned, and that new computer allows me to play games. So I am able to play newer games. Mostly I have been playing Slay the Spire, which I had before, and I started Fear 2 and Titanfall, both of which Fear 2 I have, Titanfall, or Titanfall 2, excuse me, my son had, and I started playing those. They're both good. I just haven't found a lot of time to progress through them. But I, I saw this article and I wanted to talk about something that is related to the casual game fad. In the, sometime in the 2000s, 2008, let's say 2010, maybe 2012, uh, there was a new kind of game emerging in the Facebook marketplace where it was a plugin that you could put in Facebook and then you could play this game in Facebook. Uh, and the game that was most popular in this ma platform was a game called Farmville. Now Farmville is a model of game that we see all the time now, which is you have a some sort of space and you do things in that space to get more stuff. In Farmville, you would plant cows or you would start a task with your different farm things and or you'd plant crops or say milk your cows or something. And the way the game worked, there was a certain amount of time in real time that you had to wait before you could get this, the harvest from that process. So like say you were gonna milk your cows, it would take five minutes to milk your cows. And then once you were done milking your cows, a little pail with milk in it would appear on the barn and you had to click it to say, sell that milk or put that milk in the dairy storage facility or something. And the trick was if you didn't click that milk and say, let's say in a half an hour, it would spoil and then it's only worth half as much or it's not worth anything at all, but it would sit there spoiling until you go and click it to get rid of it. So either way you have to click it, but if you don't click it fast enough, you get a penalty instead of a bonus or you get nothing. So Farmville was wildly popular, but there were people who said it was not good for players. It's not a good game. Uh, it was about activating your basic instincts, but not about engaging you or telling a story or helping you become a better person. It was sort of serotonin purified. Well, game designer Ian Bogost uh, designed a game called Cow Clicker in which you would download the game and you get a cow and once a day or once every six hours or something, you can click on it and you get a point. And after you have done this enough times, then you can use your points to buy something like, say, a cow that faces the other way. It was all very simple and it was meant to be a satire of games like Farmville. Well, his problem was that people started playing it as though it was not a satire, as though it was real, and they went kind of crazy for it. Well, he eventually stopped the game and there was a bunch of stuff that happened, but you know, the long and short of it was the was this satire of this kind of game. Well, I just read the other day that there is somebody making six figures selling a game called like Otter Petter or Otter Stroker, I think, where you, it's a picture of an otter and you click a button to, to pet the otter. That's all it does. And they have a whole bunch of different ones with different animals, but they cost money to download and people are paying that money. I don't really know what that means. I don't have an answer for it. I don't have a round button to put here at the end of the episode about it, but life imitates art, imitates life is how I feel. And art is imitating life in this situation because, uh, yeah, because cow flicker has become a real thing. So with that in mind, I'm going to call it a day. 
and wish you best of luck. Uh, and thank you for joining me on my walk today. I hope that your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games.